Hey guys, this video is going to be much, much quicker. It's probably good because I'm going to be taking some of you in and out for pat testing today. But basically what we're doing with this video is we're trying to get a bit deeper into the categorical imperative and understand why Immanuel Kant thought that it was important to make those three principles really stand out. Okay, so our overall goal, is it correct? That doesn't look right. Why didn't you correct that for me? Um, is that we're going to elaborate on why I can't rephrase the categorical imperative in three different ways that you did. And if you do want to get deeper, actually, there are five rephrasings that are outlined by a lot of scholars, but some say that they're just kind of, they're implied by the three that I've already mentioned. So for the sake of a year 10 course, I'm just trying to be really simple and outline these three for you, okay? But why did you do that? Well. We're going to elaborate on why Kant did that. So, what are you going to do today? Uh, outline a success criteria that tells us how you're going to successfully recap on what we studied previously. Outline a success criteria that tells us how you're going to understand just some new key concepts. And then, outline a success criteria that's going to allow you to completely articulate a whole theory. Get rid of this idea. Oh, yep, this is definitely your APK. Once you've it's written down three of our own success criteria, and you've scored yourself out of four on them, I'd like you to pretty please with the chair on top. Draw a diagram that represents a moral statement where the action is self-justified, because that will help you recap on the difference between necessary and contingent objects, or necessary and contingent statements, or necessary and contingent moral statements. Cheers. All right, so here's our quick recap. When we talk about a hypothetical imperative, we're talking about an imperative where what happens in clause one doesn't imply the dependent clause. So in a simple way, when you're walking your old lady across the road, you are the subject, the predicate is the walking, and the old lady is the object. And in this case, we're looking at something contingent because there's nothing about you that implies the walking. You get what I mean? And when we have one situation where the subject doesn't imply the predicate, well, guess what? We have a situation where we have a contingent um, relationship or a contingent statement. And a hypothetical imperative isn't just about old lady, you know, me in my first clause doing something contingent. A hypothetical imperative is contingent because the first clause doesn't imply the other. And another way to rephrase that is the action isn't self-justified. Now, for everybody who is really quick, you probably caught on to the fact that the reason why Kant argues for a deontology where the actions justify whether or not something is right or wrong is because he needs to come up with different statements where the actions are just self-justified. And he does that through the categorical imperative. Quickly flick, flick through your notes and talk to somebody about what we just said, because that's a quick recap. All right, now the next thing is we have necessary objects. And necessary objects are statements or objects where a name or the subject implies its predicate. And before I said that me walking an old lady has me and walking subject and predicate, um, but we don't really catch on to the fact that when you are something, that's actually an action in and of itself. To be something is an action. So to be is a predicate. So when I say I am a 40 year old male, my predicate in that statement is the 40 year old male and I am the subject. Do you get what I mean? If you don't, talk to somebody next to you, okay? Now a circle is a necessary object because the name of a circle implies a round object with no straight edges, which has a circumference that when divided by its diameter equals 3.14. A triangle is a necessary object. It'll always have 180 degrees and three sides. Parallel lines as a concept is necessary because we know that their being or what's implied by the name is two straight lines that'll never meet, all right? And with necessary objects, we don't observe them in time and space to know they're true. We don't observe them by association in time and space. They have to be proved using a, a, what we call a deductive logic. 
All right, so that's a recap. And the categorical imperative is a necessary statement. It's a deductive statement because the action implies the justification. All right. In other words, being a, a, the principle of universality, which is just a rephrase of this, is basically saying that we should act in a way that others should act in the same situation, just because it is in and of itself the right thing to do, right? Treating others as an end, not a means to an end, is completely self-justified. It is the right thing to do. And to behave as if you're creating laws and setting precedents is just the right thing to do. Quickly take a note on the things we recapped on. Now, what we didn't get into before was that these are all necessary. They're universal things. They apply no matter where we go in the universe, no matter what time we go into the universe. And they're completely logical from a Kantian point of view, okay? Immanuel Kant is the philosopher who came up with this theory. And from his point of view, they are logical. And that's really important. So we've finished the recap. Let's go into some new concepts. Get ready to take some notes. He argued that human beings live in time and space. They are different. They are contingent creatures. What they observe and who, what their bodies become are basically uh, relying on chance and cause and effect relationships and associative relationships. So take a note. But human beings also have a kind of necessary component to themselves and they're able to perform deductive logic or we also call that necessary logic. So a human being can use or perform a geometrical proof which says here is a triangle, it has this property and it has that property. Here is a circle, the same goes for that. They can use reason to get knowledge of the necessary. Okay, take a note. Now for Kant, he had a very different view of what freedom is. And this is what you need to, this is like I'm saying, if, I, if you're going to pay attention to anything in this little elaboration, this is what you need to pay attention to. All right. Kant believed that freedom isn't to be able to do whatever you want. Freedom is to be able to make a decision without any kind of external manipulation. If you're manipulated even to the slightest degree by something external to your mind, from his point of view, that takes away freedom. So it's not this kind of what we would call very bourgeois freedom that we have today, where we think it's just being able to decide and act in a way that occurs to your nature or that you, know, that you feel you need to. From his point of view, freedom can only be defined as making choices to behave and act in a way that is completely separate from any external manipulation. Take a note. Now, once you've done that, once you get that, you kind of understand why it's so important for him to find these necessary rules. Because really, from his point of view, the only thing that can manipulate you is another external contingent being or thing, right? So if I see the old lady cross the road and then I go, oh, that's the right thing for me to cross it. It's almost like the lady, it, it, she's kind of putting in place like a cause and effect relationship and she's making me a slave to this kind of cause and effect environmental relationship which puts in place these actions. And that's not freedom to cut. Right? It might be the right thing to do, but it's the right thing to do because it obeys these categorical imperatives, not because I feel some kind of emotional sentiment or it's something that happened in my environment. You can only be free if you transcend your environment and the external influences that manipulate you, which means the only choice you have to do that is to follow logic and to follow moral logic. Because once you follow moral logic, you are making a choice to free yourselves from any of those external influences. So from Kant's point of view, freedom is the action or the decision to follow necessary moral logic because that logic has no, it doesn't have any, it doesn't involve any external manipulation of you by something else. You're just following the logic. Now, some of you are smart. You've gone, hang on. But hang on, if he, isn't this just logic manipulating you? No. 
his his choices because you his action would be because you've chosen to just obey this moral logic. I mean, you still have a choice. You know, you have in turn chosen to escape the contingent um, aspect of your reality or the external things that would manipulate you and take you away from what it is to be your true self because a proper human being has the capacity to reason. Okay, a proper human being needs to engage in reason and function reasonably in order to actualize themselves and be themselves. So if something ex contingent or external does that and makes you and shapes you, that's not being free. You can only be free if you choose reason and you engage in reason. All right. So take some notes. Right. So what happens then is by understanding that Kantian freedom is a freedom to choose, or, no, or is basically Kantian freedom is a complete absence of any external compulsion and the choice to follow logic. Therefore, actions that are just logical in and of themselves and have no contingency to them are the right things to choose. Okay, which is why the categorical imperative is so important. First things first, if you were this perfectly reasonable person, not influenced by any external circumstances, you would just choose to act the same way that everybody else would behave. You get what I mean? That's a completely logical thing to do. You free yourself from contingency any external environmental factors in space and time, you just make a logical choice. Everybody else who is completely rational would make the same choice and but would behave universally the same. That's why this is really just a rephrasing of that. This is basically one way that one is morally free. Okay. Again, if you manipulate people and treat them as an object, you take away their ability to think about things logically and therefore you won't actually be able to behave logically because other people will be able to manipulate you if they don't treat you as a means to uh, as a as an end in of yourself so you want to create a society and a situation where everybody is free to escape any external manipulation which means the only way you can do that is to not be a manipulation yourself. Therefore, it logically follows that you treat others as subjects and allow them to practice their reason. And then they will make the same choices that you make and you and they will not be manipulated by anything external. Make a note. Again, if you are behaving in a way that any other completely logical and rational moral thinker would behave, right? You in turn are creating laws that you expect everyone else to behave by because it's logical and rational and they have freed themselves from contingency as well. So really these three statements are just the one statement and they're all statements that come from his idea of freedom or moral freedom, which is not being manipulated by external factors and choosing logic. Take a note. So I'll go over it again. His definition of freedom is to escape the contingent world and to think with reason. Now you have to choose it because you are contingent, but you do have access to the necessary world. Okay. But Freedom isn't being able to choose to do whatever you want. In fact, that would be the opposite of freedom for him because he'd say you're just being manipulated by external factors and that's not really free. You're just a slave to your desires. You're a slave to your environmental triggers. There's not freedom. There's no freedom in that whatsoever. So these three statements here, these three categorical imperatives completely complement what it means to be free morally. If you are free, your choices will be the same as everybody else because you are no longer influenced by anything in your environment, any other desire, any external factor other than what your mind can reasonably think about. 
if you treat others as an object, you stop them from being able to reason properly. You, in turn, make them um, a slave to external factors because you're treating them as an object. And you also don't want to be treated as an object. So everybody in society should treat everybody as a subject, which would allow you to escape contingency and think reasonably. And in the process of thinking reasonably and deciding what you're acting and how you should act, then you're setting laws for how every other rational, reasonable being should behave. Okay? And that is why the categorical imperative was so important to him, because it really has to do with his understanding of freedom and what allows a human being to be what a real human being is, which is a, a creature that can reason and uh, escape the bonds or the chains of the external. Take a note. All right, so did we recap? Yeah, we went over a lot of theory that we covered in the other video. Did we understand new key terms? You should have a really good understanding of, of Kantian freedom now, okay? Do we, do we outline a theory? You should know the relationship between the three different categorical imperatives and why they are just a rephrasing of the one categorical imperative. I didn't really go into that at length. Let me just give you one statement that really sums that up. Um, the one categorical imperative really is about how to be free and those three different statements, universality, uh, the humanity principle and the lawmaker principle are just implied by that's the statement to be free, to be free, morally free, implies the three other principles. So they are just rephrasing of the categorical imperative and to be free is morally um, justified in and of itself, according to Kant, okay? Uh, that was a pretty dense and intense philosophical theory. You should now have a really thorough understanding of what it's like to study at year 12 and year 11. This, that's the level of depth that we get to, all right? So thank you very much for spending time with me and have a lovely day.